Hello, my name is Liam Olds and I'm Conservation Officer at Bug Life, the Invertebrate Conservation Trust. Thank you for tuning in to this UK oil beetles training workshop. This training workshop will cover the identification and ecology of oil beetles within the UK and was produced as part of the Back from the Brink project, which is a partnership project between Natural England and Rethink Nature and funded by the National Lottery Heritage Fund. So this training workshop will cover the following topics. Uh, what are oil beetles? The life cycle of oil beetles? our UK species and their ecology and identification, the threats that are facing oil beetles, and then finally how you go about finding and recording oil beetles. So the first thing to cover really is what are oil beetles? So oil beetles are insects, they have a three part body uh, comprising a head, a thorax and an abdomen and three pairs of legs. They belong to an insect order called the Coleoptera, which are the beetles. Within the beetles, they belong to a family called Meloidae of which we have 11 UK species. Unfortunately, three are now gone extinct, so that's left us with eight species, uh, five of which are what we consider true oil beetles, uh, and one of those is pictured on the right there. And then we have three other species that don't typically look like what many people consider oil beetles, and these are the orange-shouldered blister beetle, the ivy bee beetle, which in the UK is confined uh, solely to the Channel Islands, and the Spanish fly as well. And this training workshop will just cover the, the five uh, true oil beetle species. So the first step in oil beetle identification is confirming that what you're looking at is in fact an oil beetle and not another type of beetle. And one of the uh, confusion species with oil beetles is often the bloody, uh, nose, bloody nose beetle, which is pictured on the left here. Uh, and you can see to, to begin at it could come, cause some confusion because it's quite a large black beetle that looks superficially similar to oil beetles, but it has a number of so the key characteristics that differentiate it from oil beetles. Uh, one of those is the, the wing cases on the abdomen. So the wing cases or the elytra, they cover the entire abdomen in this large bloody nose beetle. In comparison to oil beetle, which you pictured on the right, where you see has short wing cases, which leaves much of the abdomen uh, exposed. Also the, the thorax, or the second sort of segment of the body on the large bloody nose beetle, is also larger and more shield shaped in comparison to a more sort of square or sometimes rectangular shaped thorax in oil beetles. And this large bloody nose beetle also has these swollen uh, feet. So they're swollen into large pads, which is another sort of feature that oil beetles don't have. But perhaps a more convincing um, confusion species is the devil's coach horse beetle. And as you can see on, on the picture here, being a, a rove beetle or staphylinid, it has these short wing cases. So much of his abdomen is exposed in the same way as it is with oil beetles. Um, but it does have a number of features that help to differentiate it from oil beetles. Uh, one of those is the large jaws at the front. So this is a predatory beetle. Uh, so it has these large jaws that are not present in oil beetles. Um, it also has different behavior as well. So if you've ever encountered devil's coach horse beetle while exploring the countryside, you'll know how aggressive they can be. And they tend to uh, curl their abdomen um, upwards a bit like a, a scorpion, um, and that's a threat posture uh, that they exhibit that you'll never see that in, in oil beetles. And also their abdomen isn't swollen in the same way as it is in oil beetles, uh, which you can see quite clearly on, on the images here as well. So they're about the, the two major sort of confusion species with oil beetles. So once you've kind of understood the identification um, of large bloody nose beetles and devil's coach horse beetles, then you can be quite confident then um, when you see uh, what, what is an oil beetle then. So coming on to um, oil beetles themselves, um, and the reason behind them being called oil beetles is because um, when they're threatened, they produce an oily substance from their joints. So you can see in this picture here, uh, this oil beetle is obviously being handled, so it's, it feels as though it's threatened, and it's exuding this um, oily substance from its joints. And this is um, an anti-predator technique, so, so the oil is uh, foul tasting, so it's a way of deterring predators and stop the oil beetle from, from being eaten. And this oily substance contains um, a compound called cantharidin, which is a, a desirable compound to a, a number of different uh, insect species. And as you can see on the image on the left here, you've got an oil beetle that's well, almost entirely covered in biting midges, and these biting midges are targeting the joints and trying to get at the, the oil in order to take that, this cantharidin compound and they're using it then as a way of protecting the cells from being predated. So it's a sort of a chemical defense 
uh, to protect the midges from, from being eaten um, by other things such as birds or, or bats, for instance. On the image on the right here, you can see you've got a cardinal beetle that's biting um, an oil beetle and it's doing exactly the same thing. So it's trying to get at that, that oil to take up that cantharidin compound and use it as a chemical defense. So it's, it's quite interesting um, how this uh, oily substance is seen by sort of other animals and how they also um, want, to, want to sort of take advantage of, of the oil that's produced by oil beetles. And oil beetles have these really fascinating um, life cycles, as I'm sort of going to come on to um, shortly. Um, but the life cycle really starts uh, when the adults emerge. So for some of our species, this will be in spring, um, but in other species, this can be in autumn and winter as well. And when they first emerge, they, their abdomens are very small and they hardly protrude from, from under the wing cases. So this is when they're most likely to be confused with um, other sort of beetle species. Um, and once they've um, then emerged, they'll start uh, feeding. And once they start feeding, then that abdomen will sort of fill out and take that typical oil beetle shape. Uh, and then that'll be the, the sort of the typical oil beetle that you many of you will be familiar with. Um, once they've um, emerged, um, the, the sort of food plants that they'll eat will be things like lesser celandine, uh, soft grasses, dandelions, uh, buttercups, and hawk bits, but there's still a lot to be learned really about uh, what the adults will actually um, consume. And once they've sort of um, eaten, they'll start to look for mates. Um, and as you can see in this image here, you've got um, a mating pair of uh, violet oil beetles. So, so they'll um, emerge, feed up, um, and then the courtship um, and mating will then begin. Once the females have mated, uh, they've then got to look for a, a suitable uh, nest lay inside. And this will often be areas of a bare ground um, that's usually compacted as well. So this um, frequently uh, brings them into contact with people exploring the countryside because they have a tendency to, to target footpaths because the soil there is nice and compacted and then the erosion with all the footfall then creates a nice um, open bare ground. And as you can see in this image on the left, you've got a, a female black oil beetle that's excavating her nest burrow into which she'll lay her eggs and some of the eggs um, are pictures on the right here and she'll lay um, as many eggs as she possibly can do in a relatively short life and she'll lay perhaps upwards to about a thousand eggs um, per nest burrow and she'll try to create as many nest burrows as she can um, and the reason she's trying to lay so many eggs is because so few um, will reach, reach adulthood which um, will become a bit more clear uh, shortly. So these eggs hatch into these long-legged larvae, which are known as triunculids. Um, and as you can see, these are our five um, remaining species of a uh, true oil beetle in the UK. And each of the uh, triunculids associated with each of these species is rather distinctive. Uh, so our largest um, triunculids are for the violet oil beetle on the far left. Uh, so these are about two millimeters long um, and black all over. And then working our way to the right, then we have the black oil beetle triangulate, which is about um, one and a half millimeters long and yellow orange all over. Then we have the, the rugged oil beetle um, and it, its triangulates have um, a rather dark head. And the second segment is also quite dark and these are only about five, um, half a millimeter long. Uh, the next one along again is the short necked oil beetle, which is uh, very small, same size as a rugged, but half a millimeter long and dark brown all over. And then you've got your Mediterranean on the far right there, which is um, a little bit bigger than the previous two species, about 0.8 millimeter long and orange all over. So if you can get a clear look at the triangulids, then it is rather straightforward in order to identify them. And this is where a magnif magnifying glass um, can really be useful in sort of seeing um, these rather small um, first uh, in style, first stage of the larvae um, close up. And these um, triangulids, they're long-legged for, for one good reason, really, is that they need to position themselves on flowers. So, so the first stage um, of this oil beetle's life, cy life cycle is to really um, get up and position themselves on flowers. And as you can see on the left there, you've got um, an orange um, colored black oil beetle triangulid uh, that's positioned itself on a flower. It's rather hard to see because it's um, orange. It doesn't quite contrast in the same way as the violet oil beetle triangulids do on the right. So on that second image on the right, you can see that there's a lot of violet oil beetle triangulids, which are black, 
and they contrast well against um, the yellow um, dandelions that they're on. And it's often um, easier to see uh, oil beetles when they're on uh, something like yellow flowers, uh, like dandelions or buttercups and, and that sort of thing, especially for the violet oil beetle triangulids, which are dark. For our smaller triangulids, uh, which are like the rugged, the short necked, and the Mediterranean, it can be more of a challenge to spot the triangulids. Uh, as you can see on the image on the left here, you've got um, a buttercup. And then when you zoom in, you can see on the right there that there's three little uh, rugged oil beetle triangulids on there. And you can see how easy it would be to, to miss these um, smaller species. And this is where a magnifying glass held over the flower is a, is a good way of spotting uh, these small triangulids. And the reason that these triangulids are gathering themselves on, on flowers is because they need to attach themselves to a solitary bee um, and ideally a female as well. So you've got an, an image here on the left of um, a sandpit mining bee female and you can see on the zoomed up image on the right that there's a number of violet oil beetle triangulids and they've tucked themselves um, behind the back of the abdomen um, and between the abdomen and the thorax. And what these triangulids are trying to do is they're trying to hitch a ride um, back to the nest where they'll disembark um, and they'll start eating the pollen and nectar stores that the, the female bee um, intended to provide for her own, own offspring. So, so oil beetles are uh, parasites, um, nest parasites of solitary bees. So they're bad news for the, the solitary bees, um, but of course uh, the oil beetles have got to uh, make a living as well. And here you can see, uh, if you can just see on the, on the side of the thorax of this um, block, um, box headed blood bee, that there's a, a very small uh, rugged oil beetle triangle and just tap itself on the side there. So spotting some of these smaller triangulids on bees is more of a challenge. Unfortunately, they, they don't always get it right. So the aim is really to get on a female solitary bee so they can go back um, to the nest. Uh, if they get themselves onto a male, they might be lucky when the male um, finds a female and mates with the female that they can then get onto the female, um, the female mining bee. Um, but quite often, they'll just attach themselves to anything that visits a flower. So this might be um, a solitary wasp in the case of the image on the, on the left there, or it could be uh, hoverflies or, or bumblebees or something else. And, and the ones that get on the wrong type of, of insect are effectively doomed. Um, and that, that comes back to the point I made earlier really about why they lay so many eggs is because so few of them actually get it spot on and they attach themselves um, to the right solitary bee to get back to that nest. But as they lay so many eggs, um, of course, um, a small minority of them will make it and become adults like uh, the adult pictures on the right. So it is worth it in the end. So that is um, the sort of fascinating life cycle of oil beetles It's intricately linked um, to that of solitary bees. Um, and now coming on to our UK species and their identification. So we have five species of true oil beetle uh, within the UK. And these can be split between three daytime spring active species, which are the black oil beetle, the violet oil beetle and the short necked oil beetle. And then two nocturnal um, winter active species, which are the rugged oil beetle and the Mediterranean oil beetle. So we'll go through uh, each of these species now and talk a bit about um, the habitats you can find them in, the times of year, and also their identification features as well. So starting with the, the black oil beetle, this is probably one of the most frequently encountered oil beetle within the UK. The adults are daytime spring active. Uh, they emerge from about uh, mid to late February um, on nice um, sort of uh, nice warm uh, winters. Uh, then through to about June time, you can find them in meadows and coastal grassland. Uh, they're widely distributed across Britain, as you see um, in a later map. Uh, but you can also get them in gardens as well, particularly in uh, coastal areas. They're rather large, so up to about three centimeters in length. They have a, a square shaped thorax, which is important when it comes to identification. So the black oil beetle and the violet oil beetle, which is the next species is going to be covered, both have a square shaped thorax. And then the remaining three species all have a rectangular shaped thorax. So just, and just knowing that the shape of the thorax uh, can help narrow down um, what, what you're looking at. The, the males uh, and females are rather easy to sex because the males have these strongly kinked antennae, whereas the females have only um, a slight uh, kink in their antennae. So um, the image um, on the right here 
this is a female, so there's only a slight sort of kink or bend in her antennae. Um, and as you see on later images, the males is really strongly kinked. So the antennae are almost thrown out in a different direction because one of the segments is a different shape from the others. The triangulids of, of black old beetles um, hatch within just a few weeks of being laid. So the adults are active um, in that period I've mentioned between sort of uh, mid to late February through to about June. Uh, they'll be laying uh, their eggs then and they'll hatch within that same year. Uh, so this can be anywhere um, between sort of June and July quite often. And it's worth kind of noting that um, although I've mentioned a few times that the adults are active between sort of February and June, it doesn't mean a single individual is active during that time period. Um, it just means as a whole the species is, but you'll get some individuals that emerge earlier in that time period and then others that might be at the later end of that time period as well. And this is a sort of typical habitat that you think of for black oil beetles. So, um, they're particularly abundant um, in the southwest of England. So on the left here, you've got some soft rock cliff habitat um, down in the southwest of England. And this is where you'll get your solitary bees nesting. You can see it's quite flower rich as well. So that's all that ideal conditions for uh, the solitary bees. Also good then for the oil beetles as well, because there's good, good populations of solitary bees and there's plenty of flowers for their triangulids um, to hang around on and, and attach themselves. Uh, to the solitary bees as well. On the right here um, is a, another example um, and what I would think of as being quite typical black oil beetle habitat. So this is up in uh, North Wales and you've got um, a footpath, um, a coastal footpath. So you've got that compacted ground um, and bits of bare ground as well for, for the black oil beetle uh, females to excavate their nest burrows. It's um, got wildflowers nearby so there's opportunities for the triangulids to get themselves on flowers. Um, and what's not quite visible in this image, but, but just on the right um, over the fence is um, some soft rock cliff habitat, very similar to what's um, in the image on the left. So you've got those nesting opportunities for, for solitary bees as well. But as I've mentioned, you can also get them in gardens as well. So you're not fully restricted to coastal grasslands or inland meadows. You could get them in other places as well. And this is um, a map that kind of shows the distribution of black oil beetles um, across Great Britain. And it was produced by records generated by iRecord uh, between the period of 2006 and uh, 2021, so the last 15 years. Um, and as you can see, they, they found widely across um, England, Scotland and Wales, but the vast majority um, of records are generally in the sort of the southwest of England and around the Welsh coast. It is also worth noting that um, the black oil beetle is also found on the Channel Islands. And then coming on to the, the violet oil beetle, again, this is a daytime spring active species. It's, it's active a bit later in the year, so it's, I don't often get them in February. It's usually in sort of March time, but again, then through, through um, March, then through to about June. Uh, you'll find them in meadows, so very similar um, habitat, habitats to where you'll see the black oil beetle. And you can also get them in coastal grasslands as well in, in some um, areas of, of Britain. Um, but as a, as a general rule, they're quite strongly associated with woodland edge. So if you see an oil beetles at the edge of, of woodlands, uh, broadleaf woodlands, then it's quite, quite likely that you're looking at a violet oil beetle rather than um, a black oil beetle. It has a very western distribution, so the vast majority um, of violet oil beetle sites are in the southwest of England, Wales um, and Scotland. Um, as well as parts of northern England as well. It's a rather large species, again, so around the same sort of size as a black oil beetle, up to about three centimetres in length. It has um, a square-shaped thorax. The males have those um, strongly kinked antennae again, like it is in the black oil beetle. So this is um, actually a male pictured here, and hopefully you can see perhaps quite clear on the, on the right um, antennae how it sort of bends round very obviously, and that's because uh, one of the segments is a different shape to the others and it kind of throws the whole antennae out in a different direction. So they're really easy to sex uh, both black and violet oil beetles because you can look at the antennae and if you're seeing a really obvious sort of bend then you know you're looking at the male. If there's only really a slight little bend uh, then it'll be a female. With the, the violet oil beetles the, the eggs that they lay um, in spring they take nearly a year to hatch. So so when you see in triangulids that are active alongside the adults um, in spring, those triangulids have actually been produced 
um, by the previous generation of orbital adults. And this is the sort of um, habitat that you'll get violet orbital. As I mentioned, you can get them in meadows and you can also sometimes get them in sort of coastal areas as well. Um, but probably one of the more um, sort of distinctive sort of habitats of violet orbitals are sort of like woodland clearings and woodland edge. So on the left here, you've got um, a nice sort of open area um, on Dartmoor, as you can see there's woodland um, around there. Um, and this is, uh, Dartmoor is quite a strong, a uh, natural stronghold for violet dog beetle. And then on the right here is kind of what I would consider a um, typical sort of violet dog beetle habitat. You've got a footpath on the edge um, of broadleaf woodland. So again, you've got that bare ground in order for the, the adults to excavate their nest. Um, what's not clear in the image is that um, there are lots of things like celadines and dandelions um, nearby as well. So you've got those areas that the triangulids can gather um, in order to attach yourselves uh, to solitary bees. And this um, map again produced by iRecord uh, records between 2006 and 2021 shows the general distribution of violet orbital people um, across uh, Great Britain. As you can see, um, as I mentioned previously, it has a very western distribution. So, so the east of England, there are very, very few records tends to be the southwest of England is a bit of a stronghold, parts of Wales as well, um, and then northern England and Scotland as well. Uh, it's not, not known from the Channel, Island, Channel Islands as well, so that's um, worth making a note of that. So the, the black and the violet orbital are our two most common species, but unfortunately um, identifying the two is, is a bit of a challenge. They're both uh, very uh, superficially similar. Um, so you've got to really uh, take care when it comes to identifying uh, black and violet orbitals. And it is a bit of a pain that our, our two most common species um, are the greatest challenge when it comes to orbital identification. But the main thing you want to be doing really is looking at, at the thorax, because that, that, that thorax includes a number of key uh, characteristics that will help you with your identification. Um, the most reliable um, character for identifying um, black or violet orbitals is the, the presence or absence of a strong tooth um, below the thorax. So um, on the image on the right here, you've got a, a violet orbital and it, it, below the thorax is this really strong uh, tooth, which uh, hopefully is um, clear enough in this image. So this is really reliable. When you're seeing a tooth, um, a fairly large tooth below the thorax, then you know you're looking at the violet orbital because in the black orbital, this tooth is very small um, or almost absent. So look for that tooth um, really as a, the first um, port of call when it comes to identifying uh, black or violet oil beetles. Um, another thing you can look at then is the, the basal margin um, of the thorax, which is um, almost straight in black oil beetle. And it's sort of more um, indented or V-shaped um, in violet oil beetle. Um, and then another key characteristic then is um, the violet oil beetle has got these little depressions in the base of the thorax as well, almost like um, it's got little bits that have been chiseled out, um, which is not, not present in the black. So there shouldn't be any depressions um, in, in the base of the black oil beetle thorax. And then with a little bit of practice as well, the, the actual punctures on both the head and the thorax, and particularly the thorax, um, can also help with identification. So the punctures on, on the thorax of the black oil beetle um, tend to be larger and they're, they're also quite, they're also deeper as well. And then in contrast to the, on the violet, the depressions are a lot finer, so they, they're not as big um, and they, they're not as deep as well. So they're the main um, identification uh, features really in separating black and violet oil beetle. And then habitat can be a useful uh, clue as well. So if you're you're tending to see the old beetles on the edge um, of, of woodlands, then you're more than likely going to be looking at, at that violet old beetle. But if you can have a close look at the thorax and try to see whether you've got that strong tooth below it um, and some of those other features as well, uh, then that's really the best way to go to be 100% um, certain. And here's just um, another couple of images that are just comparing the black on the left uh, to the violet on the right. Um, and then if you look at the violet, you can see in this image, it's quite obvious that the, the punctures on the thorax and the head are finer uh, than in the black oil beetle. Um, and also you've got the tooth is, is obvious um, here as well in this image, um, as well as the little depressions in, in the base 
as the thought yeah. as well when he's sort of been uh, chiseled out a bit. And that's all I can say really is just um, just keep keep looking at the two different species and just practicing and eventually you'll sort of click in your head as to how to separate the two. Uh, but of course, if you if you can't um, sort of separate the two, um, then this is where taking images is really useful. And then, then somebody will be able to um, confirm your identification and hopefully, um, yeah, help help you with that with that identification as well. And quite often you might have to um, look at the orbitals from different angles. So top down view tends to be um, the best. Um, but you might have to supplement that with some other um, different angles as well, such as this one here. If you can see this little bit of a side on angle, um, it shows those um, depressions in the base of the thorax. This is a violet orbital. Um, what's not quite clear here is the tuff, but there's a bit of a tuff there as well. Um, but I recommend um, taking photographs, and if you can get as many photographs from as many different angles as you can, then that'll sort of um, put you in good stead, really, for identifying uh, these orbitals. And then the next um, daytime spring active species that we got is the short necked orbital, which is a very rare species. So there's um, relatively little chance that you'll come across it, but it's worth sort of bearing in mind um, that, that this species, of course, exists. Um, and hopefully um, a few new sites will be found um, by people being uh, vigilant when they're out walking. But this is, um, yeah, daytime spring active, active from about March to June, so very similar time period to uh, the previous two species. You'll find this in uh, coastal grasslands, um, coastal dunes, and heathland as well. It has a, another very western distribution. It's a, a small species, so it's smaller than the previous two species. It grows up to about uh, 24 millimeters or two and a half centimeters in length. It has a rectangular shaped thorax, so the thorax is wider than it is long. They're shiny blue-black in color, and I think this is what really helps with their identification is, is their shininess as well as their small size. And of course, our rectangular shaped thorax, which um, instantly rules out um, the black and the violet orbital, which both have uh, square shaped thorax. And then the antennae then are rather short, um, they're straight as well, and then they're slightly thickened um, at the tips. And unfortunately, there's, it's not easy to, to sex these short necked orbitals because the males don't have those kink in the antennae. Uh, so this is where you have to look at the underside, and I'll talk a bit about that. Um, later on in this talk. So the short-necked orbital is known from only a few um, sites in, in the UK. Um, so there's uh, one site is, is down in Dalbury Down um, in Devon. Um, and then there's also a site then um, around the Salisbury Plain area. There's also one in South Pembrokeshire. And then you've got then the other main British sites then are uh, on the Outer Hebrides of Scotland. And then outside of um, Britain and the UK, there's uh, also a population on the east coast of Ireland. So it's a very uh, sporadic um, distributed species, so very isolated populations. As you can see in this bit of a map, all of the darker green spots uh, show where there are sort of modern um, records for this species, so um, existing populations. And then the lighter green area show where the species used to be, but is presumed extinct. So it was and more widespread, particularly in southern England. And uh, there's also a lot more uh, sites in Wales as well and parts of northern England, but it's been lost from a vast majority of sites and was actually presumed to be extinct uh, for quite a, a long period until it was rediscovered um, in 2006. And now we're coming on to our nocturnal autumn and winter active species. Uh, so the first of these is the, the rugged orbital, which is active from about late September to early April. It's a, a nationally scarce species that's associated with uh, chalk and limestone grasslands. You get in a lot of places that have got this sort of habitat. So one of those um, is a sort of Cotswolds area, but also the Mendip Hills. They're about the two uh, major um, UK strongholds. Uh, but you can also get them in gardens as well. Uh, so um, you can also turn up um, quite frequently in gardens uh, in these sort of chalk and limestone districts. And it's found across um, South, South uh, Southern England and a few places in Southeast Wales as well. And it's a rather small species. So it grows up to about um, 19 millimeters or just under two centimeters in length. Uh, as you can see, it has very roughened uh, wing cases, which is kind of what gives it its name Rugosus. It's generally a lot duller looking than all of the previous uh, species. It has these um, straight antennae 
Uh, so there's no kinks again, so it's rather difficult to identify them. It has this rectangular shaped thorax in the same way as the short neck does, um, but has these um, distinct um, narrow grooves running down the middle, which it helps separate, separate it from the much rarer uh, Mediterranean oil beetle, which is the next species is going to be covered. So the regular oil beetle should be a, a fairly straightforward species to identify because it's, it's rather small, it's rather dull looking, it's very roughened, um, and the only confusion species is really going to be with the Mediterranean. And this uh, map on the right shows the, the distribution of rugged oil beetle. And as you can see, it is a scarce species, um, only known from parts of southern England and southeast Wales. Uh, so unless you're in these sort of areas, you're not, not likely to encounter it, and it's not known from any of the Channel Islands as well. And this is a sort of uh, typical habitat that you would get uh, rugged oil beetle. So it's, its UK stronghold really is in the Cotswolds and the Mended Hills. Um, and you get it on those chalk and limestone grasslands, um, of, of which a few examples are pictured here. So we've got Swift's Hill on the left, which is um, a lovely um, calcareous grassland uh, site near Stroud. And then another one, which is uh, on the right, which is Rough Bank. Uh, and it, these sort of like short, um, short cropped, flower rich um, grasslands um, are really good for solitary bees um, and in turn um, important for the rugged old beetle as well. And it's been a lot of work going on in the Cotswolds as part of the Back from the Brink project. Um, and a lot of um, new sites have been discovered for the rugged oil beetle, um, thanks to the work um, of butterfly conservation um, that have been going out with, with volunteers and doing lots of surveys um, at night in autumn and winter to try, try to locate these beetles. And we're also um, doing some work to try to find um, the potential hosts of rugged oil beetle as well. So there's a lot to be learned about what potential solitary bees um, these um, beetles are using. Um, and the same is the case with the other oil beetles as well. There's still a lot to be learned um, about which uh, particular bees they're using. And then the final um, species that's covered um, in this training workshop is the Mediterranean oil beetle. As I mentioned, this is a very rare species. Again, nocturnal, autumn and winter, active around the same period, late September to about early April. You get it in uh, coastal grasslands, so it's only known from coastal areas, um, and you can really, well, rather rarely get them in gardens within these coastal areas as well. It's known only from southern England, so it's only known from uh, South Devon and uh, Sussex as well. It's um, a rather large species, so it tends to be larger than the rugged oil beetle, so it can grow up to about 36 millimeters in length. Uh, sometimes it can be about around the same, similar sort of size, but quite often they're larger. In superficial, it looks very similar to a rugged oil beetle. Also, it has these roughened wing cases, rather dull body, has a straight antennae. Again, so it's not easy to set the individuals. And again, it has those rectangular shaped thorax. Um, but the, the key thing it really is for identifying this is that although it looks superficially similar to the rugged um, in almost every way, um, the one thing it does, does lack really is that distinct narrow groove running down the middle of the thorax, which is present in the rugged. Um, and absent in this Mediterranean. And this image here um, kind of shows uh, the difference between the two. So the white arrow points to the groove that's running down the middle of the, the thorax of the rugged, uh, which is absent in the Mediterranean. So you have to sort of take care really when you, you sort of look in at something that might be either a rugged or a Mediterranean, um, just to make sure that you, you can see that, that groove running down or not. And that can be the difference between seeing um, quite a scarce beetle for the rugged and a very rare beetle for the Mediterranean. And here is just an image that shows uh, the two species side by side. side. So you can see the size difference is, is rather um, obvious in this case. You can see the much smaller rugged oil beetle on the right, just about make out the little groove running down uh, the thorax. And then on the left there, you've got the, the larger Mediterranean it, that's lacking that uh, distinct groove down the middle of the thorax. So I mentioned a, um, a few times previously um, that the, the last three species, the rugged, Mediterranean and short-necked, um, they, they don't have those obvious kinks um, in the antennae of the males, so it's not easy to, to separate the sexes. And this is where you'll have to uh, turn the beetles over and look at the, the final um, abdominal segment or the very tip of the abdomen from the underside in order to uh, sex them. And in this um, Middle image here, you can see this final segment, 
um, how is rather rounded and it's got a little indentation. So this would indicate a male, whereas in the female, it tends to be um, a wider segment, not quite as um, obviously uh, curved, um, doesn't seem to have this little um, indentation. Um, and that would help to uh, separate the, the two different sexes. But um, quite often you don't, don't need to, to sex the individuals. Um, and it's worth bearing in mind that, that by picking them up and turning them over, this could cause um, the animal stress. So I would uh, generally advise to avoid um, handling them uh, if at all possible, and only really to be sexed them if it's um, a real urgent need, if it's perhaps um, as part of a scientific study where you really need to, to know whether you're looking at a male or a female. So unfortunately, oil beetles, um, as amazing as they are and um, as fascinated they are with the life cycles, they are um, under threat. So all beetle populations are dependent upon the health and diversity of wild bees as they are um, solitary bee nest parasites. Um, and the decline in our, our wild bees has resulted in the decline in all beetle populations. And fortunately, um, as I mentioned previous, uh, three of our um, species are now considered extinct. Um, and in our remaining five, all of which have been covered in this um, training workshop, um, have also sort of suffered rather drastic declines and they're all considered um, a priority for conservation. So it is important that we kind of get out, um, look for all beetles and record where they are as well. And when it comes to finding all beetles, there's kind of two major options. You can either look for the adults, which is what most people do and more people are likely to encounter adults than they are the larvae. So you can get out, um, of course, for our daytime spring active species, you need to be getting out in the daytime in spring to look for those. And then with the autumn and winter active species, of course, you need to be getting out um, at night in autumn and winter to look for those. Um, and so kind of getting out at the right time of year, uh, also kind of the, the right time of day for our daytime, uh, daytime species. So in sort of nice warmish sort of dry uh, weather conditions are about best. Um, and if you're kind of looking for, um, for the adults, you're kind of best kind of going towards areas that are rich in solitary bees. So there might be um, quite a lot of bare ground, quite a lot of flowers, maybe somewhere you know that you've seen uh, solitary bees mining, for instance, would be all um, good areas to look for the adults. And also kind of keeping an eye on footpaths as well. So looking for those females uh, that might be excavated in nest burrows. And then the other alternative then is to look for the triangulids. Um, so this is where you've got to be kind of looking on flowers. Um, and as you can see on the image um, on the right here, you've got a lot of violet orbital triangulids um, on a dandelion. Spotting the violet orbital triangulids um, is a bit more straightforward because although they are small, um, they tend to gather on yellow flowers and then they sort of contrast um, quite obviously then. But spotting some of the others um, might be more challenging, particularly with the, the very small triangulids like the rugged orbital triangulids. Um, that we've seen earlier. This is where a magnifying glass held over the flowers would really help um, in spotting those. And we've seen the difficulties in separating black and violet orbital um, adults. So in that case, it's quite easier, um, quite often, to identify the triangulids of these because the violet uh, orbital triangulids are all dark and then the black orbital triangulids are orange. So it's very easy to to separate the two in terms of triangulars, but, but not as adults. So there are a few different options really for um, finding and um, identifying orbitals. And when it comes to uh, finding the nocturnal uh, autumn and winter active species, the rugged and Mediterranean orbital, this is where you need to begin out uh, with torchlight. And the, the adults are active uh, soon after dusk. So you can go out as soon as it's sort of around dusk time, you can start going out looking. Um, you'll be using a torch and you'll be shining on the ground, um, looking um, along footpaths or just looking in amongst um, grassland. Um, and you really want to be avoiding frosty nights. So ideally uh, targeting nights where the temperature is above uh, four degrees um, Celsius. Uh, anything below that, um, then it's very unlikely that you're going to see um, the oil beetles, particularly if it's frost on the ground. So. So the targeted mild overcast um, evenings are, are really the best. And if you see any oil beetles, whether that's um, out exploring the countryside in, in the sort of the daytime in spring, or if you are going out um, at night looking for them, uh, it is really important that if you do encounter any of them, that you submit your records. 
So yeah. any records you can you submit and can be used then to deliver conservation um, on the ground. And if you sort of haven't done um, any sort of um, oil beetle recording or any sort of general wildlife recording before, uh, there's a number of um, key bits of information that's needed to sort of make your record uh, useful. So the first of those is um, the date of the sighting, so the day that you've seen the oil beetle. Uh, also the location, so, so where you've seen the oil beetle. So that can be um, the site name we don't, we'd need. Uh, so that might be, uh, if you're on like a nature reserve, the name of the nature reserve or, or the name of the field or something along those lines. Um, it might just be your, the nearest um, village uh, or town, if you're not sure um, of the name of the site you're on. And then providing um, a, a grid reference is quite key as well. So uh, we'd ask for like a six to eight figure grid reference and there are a number of free online websites that will allow you to find your grid reference. Uh, one of those is Grid Reference Finder. Uh, so if you pop that into, into a Google search engine, you'll, you'll see that that website will come up and it'll allow you to uh, find your spot on a map and it'll tell you what the grid reference would be for that particular spot. Um, your name as well, or the name of the person that, that uh, seen the, the oil beetle is always useful. Um, a brief description of, of where you are, so what sort of habitat are you in? Is it um, in woodland? Is it in the garden? Is it in uh, grassland? Uh, and that sort of thing. Uh, time of day can also be quite useful um, as well, uh, particularly when it comes to whether you're looking at a daytime spring active one or um, a nocturnal species or something. So that could be very useful. Any other information you can provide as well. So particularly with the, the nocturnal autumn and winter um, species, it's sometimes useful to know what the temperature is so we can kind of work out uh, at what sort of temperatures they're active and things like that. Um, and then a photograph is really key as well. So a photograph or a series of photographs will then allow somebody to confirm your identification. This is particularly important uh, when it comes to the black and violet orbitals so to make sure you can see how difficult they are in, in um, identifying the adults. So the photograph um, will allow us to make sure that you've uh, made your identification uh, correctly. Um, but of course, with our other oil beetles as well, the other remaining three species are all rather rare. Uh, so it's good to have uh, photographs of them as well to be able to confirm those records. And I would advise that, um, that you submit your records to the, the National Oil Beetle Recording Scheme. So this is a rather newly established recording scheme and further details can be found um, at the web a web link um, above uh, so if you can send your records into the recording scheme that would be um, fantastic and you can do that in a number of ways you can either email them direct uh, to the recording scheme or the preferred method really is to uh, submit your records um, using iRecord and if you're on uh, Twitter uh, I'd recommend sort of following the um, orbital recording scheme which can be found at, at All Beatles UK. So when it comes to iRecords, as I mentioned, this is kind of the preferred way um, that many recording schemes, including the All Beatles Recording Scheme, um, like to receive their records. Uh, if you haven't come across iRecord before, it's a free, um, a free sort of uh, website and comes in app form as well. It's rather quick and easy to use. It has a number of other benefits as well in the fact that it allows you to keep track of your own records. You can almost use it as a bit of a diary as to where you've seen a different species and when. Uh, it also allows you to view records of other people as well, so you can get to sort of see what's been recorded um, in your area. Um, the records then that you submit on iRecord are automatically available um, to the National Recording Scheme. So if you're recording an oil beetle, it'll automatically go straight to the, the National Oil Beetle Recording Scheme. Uh, but it'll also go to any other organizations that might need it. So that might be your local environmental, uh, local environmental record center. Um, so that will allow them to, to use that record uh, when it comes to things like planning applications. It might help to protect um, sites, um, also sort of influence mitigation, and, and it can be used for lots and lots of different things. So by submitting your records uh, via iRecord, um, you can make that real um, contribution then to both science and conservation. And it also promotes learning as well. So you get, you get feedback um, on your identifications. So it'll be verified and it'll be either accepted as correct or incorrect and that sort of thing. And it'll, it'll sort of, um, the feedback then will allow you to sort of um, help with your, with your learning then. So you're getting that, that feedback and knowing kind of where you've gone wrong or where you've gone right and that sort of thing. 
Um, so you can find out more about iRecord and, and uh, sign up to iRecord by visiting um, the web link at the bottom here. And what I'd really recommend is that if you're getting out um, into the field and you think you might come across all beetles or you want to go looking for all beetles, uh, to check out um, Bug Life's um, All Beetle Guide, which was produced a number of years ago and is um, a really good guide. And you can either keep this on your phone or you can print it off and take it out into the field with you. And it covers um, all five of the species that have been uh, covered in this training workshop. And it's got lots of information about identification, um, habitats, um, and also some really nice images as well. And some of those confusion species as well, like the bloody nose beetle and the devil's coach off beetle and that sort of thing. So, so do check out um, that old beetle guide, which is available freely on the Bug Life uh, website. If you're looking for alternative um, identification resources as well, um, it's worth checking out uh, Stephen Falk's Flickr album. So Stephen Falk, uh, who's an amazing entomologist, uh, he's got Flickr albums um, on, on all various sort of um, invertebrates as well as um, plants as well. Um, but he's got um, a number of the old beetles covered. So he has uh, photo albums of them with a bit more information as well. And this is particularly useful when you kind of want to look at um, closer images of black and violet old beetle and compare them uh, kind of side by side. Uh, so do check out his uh, Flickr album, uh, but Steam's also got albums on um, solitary bees and hoverflies and other things. So it's well worth uh, visiting his uh, Flickr site. So, so that's it, a bit of a whistle top uh, stop tour through um, all beetles. Uh, thank you very much for tuning in. And I'll just reiterate that um, if you do see any all beetles, do uh, try to identify them. And if you can, then do submit your records to the, the National All Beetle Recording Scheme so we can get a bit of a picture as to where all beetles are, um, how they fare in as well, and help to um, deliver conservation for these really magnificent creatures um, into the future as well. So thank you very much for tuning in.